Welcome into the KSO show, more specifically the Sunday show. We are back and running and we'll bring you these uh, every Sunday until basketball season ends on a consistent basis. It is Drew Galloway. It is Jimmy Goheen, also known as KSU underscore fan. And I am Mason Voth. And we are ready to get the season started because we actually have a game to preview for you. K-State and UT Martin taking place in less than six days from where we sit right now. And it's, I mean, it's it's a home opener. It is what it is. Uh, I think those have excitement within themselves. The opponents sometimes know, but we can all be honest. It's kind of just fun to watch your team kick the snot out of somebody, no matter how good or bad they are. Uh, it makes it a lot more carefree. It's more of just a celebration of the start of the season. And uh, you get this out of the way, and then the next 11, they're going to be real games that really, really impact how things end up playing out for you. Uh, before we dive into anything going on with that, we got football this past weekend, a little bit of it, uh, four games that involved FBS schools. And one of those, the one that kicked it all off, was over in Ireland when Florida State lost to Georgia Tech. A really fun way to start the season there for the Seminoles, no doubt, coming off all that momentum of an unbeaten season last year. And then, you know, they should have been in the playoff. Like we know, that team definitely looked ready without. Uh, without their quarterback again yesterday. K-State is up next, though. The Wildcats are going to be in Ireland as they kick off the 2025 football season against Iowa State in the Aer Lingus College Football Classic. Game tickets can be secured now through a travel or hospitality package. All-inclusive travel packages include premium game tickets, luxury hotel accommodations, an exclusive K-State welcome experience, and more. Game day hospitality packages include premium in-stadium hospitality with food and drinks and premium game tickets. Don't miss out on the trip of a lifetime. Book your package now at cats2ireland.com. That's cats, the number two, ireland.com. Uh, I'll start with Fan here. Uh, what did you think of the game in Ireland yesterday, and is your – excitement level up or down for K-State to be in that game uh, after getting just, you know, another year of being able to see how that game is played and uh, the pomp and circumstance that goes with it. I, I thought the atmosphere was pretty cool. Um, a, you know, pretty good stadium. There was a big crowd. I thought that the, they were into it. It helped that it was a competitive game because, you know, I don't know if what half – this do half those people even know the rules of American football, uh, but they're – uh, it was fun. It was a fun game to watch. Goes down the wire, game-winning field goal. Um, I I'd never mind seeing Florida State lose, so I, that was fun to see. And uh, you know, Georgia Tech's quarterback's pretty good player. I mean, I, th I thought he made some big plays in that game, and um, it's just fun to see college football back. I mean, that that was really the key takeaway for me is just to see the the atmosphere of college football back. I mean, I even watched a little bit of what it, Tarleton State and McNeese in the afternoon after that game, uh, kind of a back and forth crazy comeback game too. Um, and Jonathan Beasley is a FBO, I think, at Tarleton State, so um, K State connection. But just good to see football back, and and uh, I think the atmosphere will be a lot of fun for K State in Ireland next year. Yeah, I think that the the game in Ireland was a lot of fun. Uh, I saw that there was a commercial Aer Lingus uh, flyover instead of like a, a traditional flyover, which I thought was kind of funny. Uh, I really liked the stadium. I think the atmosphere was fun. And, and it's, it's a lot of fun when the Week Zero slate from the outside looked pretty gross uh, oh. for, for like what we were kind of expecting. And to see that game go down, go down to the wire and have a lot of other close games was a lot of fun because that was not something that I expected. I mean, even even Delaware State Hawaii didn't get as much out of hand as I think a lot of people expected. Uh, so to kind of see all of that was a lot of fun. Yeah, I'll give uh, credit to whoever had brought it up. Uh, I don't know, remember where, but I think it was people somewhat locally that were talking about it. And they they pointed out that Hawaii was like a – 39 point favorite in the game and they didn't score 39 points once last season like they didn't get to that mark and so it was and then somebody it may have been scott walker was like well but delaware was, state yeah. is like so so bad and so i didn't know what to do there but that's one of those where like in terms of gambling i do kick myself in hindsight because it's like 
Well, of course, the team that didn't score 39 last year was not going to win by 39 points. So when I woke up this morning, first thing I did was check that score. I had no skin in the game there. I did not care about the result. Uh, but I was like, I am interested to see how that ended up working itself out because everything else, uh, I mean, it's really some fascinating games. Montana State was a two-touchdown favorite as the FCS school going on the road to New Mexico. And at first it looked like Bronco Mendenhall was about to, you know, just revive and, and have another program chugging along. And now he's probably got a little bit further to go than it would appear. And SMU saved the ACC's bacon on day one of the college football season because – the ACC would have been in a world of hurt if they lost probably two of their top five playoff bid candidates uh, in the very first go round. Now, again, it really doesn't mean anything in the grand scheme of things, at least for SMU, if they had lost because they would still have all of their conference games. But this certainly stings for Florida State when you think about what's coming their way next, because this isn't even they don't even have a break until their next conference game. They play Boston College this weekend. Uh, so that is going to be something that they get to do. And who knows, you know, coming back from Ireland, is that going to impact them? Uh, and then they'll take a little break. They'll play Memphis. And then they're back to playing ACC games with Cal at SMU, Clemson, and at Duke and at Miami. Um, so they're not going to have an easy stretch of it. And uh, this, I mean, Florida State might be in the boat of having their season ended. But no doubt, fun yesterday to uh, kind of get it back in some way. And now everybody just waits until 5 o'clock on Thursday when uh, Rutgers against somebody is the very first game that kicks off and gets things rolling. And there's a handful of Big 12 games on Friday or Thursday and Friday, and we'll talk about those in a little bit. But the main reason why we are here is to talk about K-State and UT Martin, a night kick as is customary for the FCS game for the Wildcats. And I'll just start with generic question for you guys. Uh, what is the number one thing you're looking forward to about Saturday night? Drew, you can go first. Uh, I think it's just kind of uh, the the unknown of the offense. I think that the defense, I think that we're all kind of expecting K-State's defense to be one of the best in the Big 12, probably top 15 in the country. But, but the offense has some question marks as how it's all going to look with a bunch of new players along the offensive line, a new quarterback, new offensive coordinator that's never called plays before, a new quarterbacks coach. So I think that we're all kind of looking forward to seeing how that works and how the operation is. Uh, and I think that that's probably like my number one by a pretty good margin is I want to see how the offense looks and even the, the mix up, the mix up of the pace. Do we see a, a, a lot of pace for the UT, the UT Martin game? Do we see them kind of draw it back and just kind of say, "We know that our guys are better than you. Like, let's just go execute." Yeah, I, I would agree um, that uh, how the offense fares against UT Martin is, is probably the biggest thing I'll be watching. Um, I, while I think UT Martin's offense is a little bit better than their defense. Uh, UT Martin's probably their best two defensive players are their corners. And one of them, O'Shea Baker's a all American candidate for FCS this year. So uh, the challenge of playing two pretty good FCS corners, a pretty good secondary, uh, they've got a pretty good safety as well. Um, most of their losses from last year were on the defensive line, which, which, you know, I think in theory, it, it, this is a game where K state's offensive line could get some confidence and probably push, UT Martin around, but but it's always one of those give and takes in a first game. Do you just completely go take what the defense gives you because you know you can dominate that area, or do you purposely work on certain aspects of your game, specifically K State in the passing game, um, with with a young quarterback and and trying to get these receivers going? What will, what will be the approach with Connor Riley and Matt Wells as they approach this game, um, and and kind of the run pass ratio, you know. You would expect K State to run the ball a lot, but I, I would assume they're going to want to see what Avery Johnson and this passing attack can do as well in this first game. Yeah, I, I, that's the thing with me. I I kind of have just a gut feeling that they're going to come out and we're going to see maybe more passing than what would be traditional in a game like this, just because I think you want to establish that if for a number of reasons. I think number one, you want Avery Johnson to be, immediately be able to go out and just call many of the concerns that he doesn't know how to throw a football, which I think pretty much anybody outside of K-State has. 
Um, but probably more important than Avery Johnson is using game number one to really establish the pecking order moving into game two against Tulane for your receivers. Because, I mean, it, it seems unclear to us right now. And I think even when we get the depth chart, we can kind of surmise and say, okay, you know, Jace Brown is going to be here and it, it falls in line behind this. And then we see the amount of reps. I think that's going to be something that has to play out over a handful of games to develop. And I think the only way to really get guys to where you can learn if you're trusting them is by giving them the opportunity. So I think that's probably one of those where they'll use the run, which is easily the best part of their offense right now. They'll use it when they need to and then kind of give themselves a reset and then say, okay, we have, let's try and give ourselves plays where we have the opportunity to take shots, play around a little bit, if you will. I mean, that that probably looks like DJ Giddens. My guess is the first play of the year is either them going for it all with a pass or DJ Giddens. It's like, go get us at least nine yards, and then we're going to go for it all or something. Uh, and, and that's probably how I think the flow of the offense looks early on, um, just because uh, that's probably the most interesting part and probably the biggest question that this team has to answer at the start of the season so I'll be fascinated in watching how they uh, end up managing the the game plan on Saturday night. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm also curious about the, uh, you know, the rumored changes in the past schemes and and how that will break down. I'm also curious to see the wide receiver rotation after we got used to kind of Colin Klein playing three or four guys. I, are we going to go back to seeing five or six guys rotate? I mean, you'd expect to – against his opponent, but will we see that rotation early in the ball game before it gets out of hand? Hopefully it does get out of hand, but will we see it before that happens? So those are two other ones I just thought of. Yeah, fan is a smart guy. That was literally word for word what I was going to say. <laughs> the, but uh, the, the smart, receiver man. rotation, I think, <laughs> the receiver rotation, I think, is probably the number two thing for me because I, I think – and I've kind of said this all off season long, but I, I don't really think that the defense has any like pressing questions. And I'm like, Ooh, I'm really curious about this. Unless it's like Marquis Siegel, can he catch a bat? Can he catch a football this year? Like that, that would be like my one, my one question mark, but everything else, it's like the defense is just so solid, has so much depth that I think a lot of the questions and things that everybody's anticipating for uh, would be more offense oriented. Yeah, I will say, you know, the strength of UT Martin is their offense. They have a quarterback that's back, senior. If their top three receivers back, all seniors, they're, they're 32 starts on the interior offensive line. Two of those guys were first team, all league. So, I, I mean, there's potential there that you could have a few challenges with their offense just because I, they have experience and skill. They did – their running back took off and went to Oklahoma, so – uh, that's good, but they didn't bring in a guy from Vanderbilt that I think probably will be their starter uh, at, at running back and could pose some challenges just because he's at least played, you know, power four conference football. So I, I'm curious to see how good their offense really is because uh, I do think, you know, that's a top 20 offense according to Bill Connolly's preseason FCS rankings. And yes, I did look at those because I'm weird. But uh, I'm I'm curious to see how dominant the defense actually is against this offense. Yeah, I, I think you know it's interesting. We talked a little bit about these home openers and these FCS opponents that K State has faced. You guys, I think, both were in agreement before we started. This is the worst of the FCS schools that K State has faced since Chris Kleiman came. Correct? Yeah. Yeah, I think Nichols true. would be. Nichols would be next, but it's probably uh, UT Martin after Nichols. Yeah, and it you know it played out. And honestly, like I remember going into that game with Nichols, you just didn't really know what to expect because of how stinky 2018 was. And so it, it felt good and encouraging that they did what they did in that game. Then obviously they backed it up. You know, two weeks later when they went on the road and beat Mississippi State. Uh, and then you think about all the others. I mean, the last two years have been breezes in the FCS games against solid FCS opponents. Uh, and the only one that has been tight with those, you, you can see it there if you're watching on the YouTube, was the Southern Illinois game, which Skylar Thompson ended up getting hurt. So Will Howard attempted more passes in that game. Um, so 
this is they've been pretty good against these opponents, which is so weird because everywhere else you can look at it and say, Chris Kleiman has dropped a good amount of non-conference games in his time at K-State. You know, he's a little under one a year. Um, and all of them have different circumstances in them, in them. But it seems like the one thing that he is not going to let happen is uh, his team look over an FCS opponent and let them come in and do what they did to the 2014 K State team. Yeah, I, I, th- yeah, I think this his- is. Go ahead, Drew. I was going to say that that's, I think, like the, the calling card of Chris Clement starting in, at the FCS level before coming to K State. But that's. Like and, and having all the FCS transfers come in and have success, that I think that K State knows that they have guys that can can hurt you at the FCS level. Uh, the other thing that I was going to point out too is that uh, I think that this is just kind of like selective memory and just not really remembering a lot. But 2022 and 2023 with being shutouts, pretty impressive for for this day and age of offense. Yeah, yeah I think so. And I, I was going to say the same thing about you. I think the FCS background for <laughs> Kleiman uh, makes a big difference. And I think he, him taking FCS teams and going on the road and beating power power conference teams when he was a coach, both as an assistant as head coach there, makes it even more impactful. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's a good point. He, he just, he's got an understanding and, and a feel for uh, how this kind of plays out. And I guess now we'll uh, see how it ultimately ends up playing out uh, with, what goes down with UT Martin this week. Okay, I got a, qu- a couple of questions for you guys. And after this, we'll dive in and I'll, I'll let everybody kind of give a couple of different predictions that they might have for what takes place on Saturday. But these are essentially, they're more like a fantasy football type questions, but they, they're, they I think, important to people and people will be interested to hear them. So uh, who has the most rushing yards for K-State on Saturday? I, I still, I think it'll be DJ Giddens. Um, I think he'll. I think it's highly likely he gets over 100 yards. Um, probably pay, plays two and a half, three quarters. Um, they'll rotate some guys, but I still think he will get the majority of the carries before the end of the night. I'll, I'll just be different because it's not it's not fun if we all pick DJ. I'll say Dylan Edwards. <laughs> I think that he could be a big part of the game plan uh, for this this week, and think that. It's kind of like the the showcase of him like coming back to K-State, coming back into the state of Kansas. And why not showcase some of this game as like, uh, oh, yeah, 31 is good, but we also have this uh, number three that can also hurt you. That's that's a it's a great thought, Drew. Uh, but I think at the end of the day, they go with the guy that was like, he chose us first and he is our number one back. I think, I think it ends up being DJ Giddens. Uh, because I also think Dylan Edwards is going to get the ball in a lot of other ways on Saturday, and I would guess that they probably are going to be in the boat of we really don't need to expose him to too many other hits. You know, I, I, he probably gets somewhere around five carries would be my guess on Saturday, and then the rest it comes. I mean, he could have five catches on Saturday. I would not put that out of the equation, and then however many kicks he gets to return. Uh, I like you being different and and trying to go for it, but I will also go with DJ Giddens here. The next question is, who has the most receiving yards on Saturday? Because the receiving situation has to bear out. And this one's kind of interesting, too, because they're going to have so many guys that they're probably going to try to work in. And then we know, based on how they let Avery Johnson come in and play last year, like when the backups get in there, they're still going to be throwing the ball because those guys need in-game college reps of throwing the football. Uh, so who is your pick to lead in receiving yards on Saturday? Drew, you get to go first. Uh, well, I've been chugging along the uh, Keegan Johnson bandwagon for the last uh, probably month or so, so I feel like I would be kind of dumb if I just got off the bandwagon right now. So I'll say Keegan Johnson. I, I think it'll be close, but I'll, I'll go with Jace Brown. Just because I, I think it's going to be whoever ends up with that big catch of fifty plus yards, and it could. I mean, I, I think it could be about any of those top three or four wide receivers. But I'll I'll go with Jace Brown getting the big forty nine yard touchdown catch in this game. Well, and that's a, a couple others. That's that's great logic, fam. Which is why I'm going with Jaden Jackson on on Saturday. A repeat. A repeat. <laughs> 
Yes. Yeah. Cause he loved nothing more than the, the home non-con games last year. Uh, just firing it up early with big touchdowns and he's got the speed and everything else. You're right. This could really be anybody. Uh, there's probably five guys that if it ended up being them, I would not be shocked if, if they were the leaders at the end of it. Um, cause they could all do it in a multitude of ways. Yes. There are the guys that like you can picture the, the 30 yard pass in the air that is then caught by Jace Brown or whoever else you could also envision, you know, somebody Dylan Edwards breaking off a bunch of them. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see how that one plays out, but I, uh, I will go with Jaden Jackson just to give three different answers there. <laughs> I have a little bit of trivia for you guys. Uh, who led K state in receiving last year in the home opener? Uh, led in receiving last year in the home opener, Philip Brooks. Um, I am going to go with boy. I, I, this is a horrible question. Was it DJ Giddens? No, K State had two 100 yard receivers, uh, but RJ Garcia Ooh. had 119 yards against CMO to did. lead the team. Mm, wow. Ben Sennett wow. had Ben Sennett was second with 100. Man, I we should go back and find what we were saying about RJ Garcia being the truth after week one last year. Uh, because coming off the Big 12 I, title game and then that we would have been crowning him. I think that I did like the the math on it during the season. I think that like seventy four percent of RJ Garcia's yards last year came in the home opener. That sounds about right. Uh, so yeah, that's wish him luck wherever he is right now. Uh, okay, Bowling Green, Bowling Green. special <laughs> team. Is there a special teams touchdown scored on Saturday? Mm, I. I I'm going to say yes on a blocked punt touchdown. Oh, vibes are high because I was going to say yes regardless, but I'll say yes on a, on a punt return. All right, well, I'll join the fun. I'll say yes. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to say it's on a kick return. So, oh, three different ways. Uh, I, hey, well, you know, I, I tell you what, if K-State is receiving the opening kick, that one's going back for six. That's going to be your Ooh. Dylan Edwards welcome home party. There, that would be pretty cool. So I thought that you were, I thought that you were going to say K State was going to score it all three of those different ways and just three special teams TDs to start the year. Yeah, I mean that would be awesome. Avery Johnson just doesn't even see the field for the first three scores of the game. By the third one, Chris Kleiman's like, "We have to go for two so I can let my quarterback throw the ball before halftime." Uh, <laughs> yeah, this maybe this is uh, going to be a little bit of a, a recent memory question because we can think back to 2022 and how it started but that first play from scrimmage Malik Knowles takes it and goes for a touchdown do you guys have a favorite like season opener play that you can think of and remember outside of that one uh I remember Morgan Burns returning the opening kick for a touchdown one year mm -hmm. and then Jesse Ertz got hurt on the first offensive play so that sucked <laughs> but the Morgan Burns touchdown was electric well, he probably would have been a lot looser if they had let him go out on the field the first series of the game. Yeah, I, that's a good question. I, going back, it seems like a lot of our first plays were like a three-yard gain on a inside run of some sort. So um, it, it's hard to beat last year's. Like that end around, you know, jet sweep for the score was was pretty cool. And I, you know, I remember the the kickoff return touchdown as well. Um, I'd have to I'd have to go back and look. I, I don't remember any plays quite. I, I don't remember many first place scores in in my thirty years of watching K State football. Yeah, that would that'd be fascinating. Yeah. Do you want to? Do you guys want to hear just some random uh, first yes. plays of yesteryear? <laughs> okay, uh, negative uh, yard run for Winston <laughs> Uh Yeah, well, let's go check it out. 2016. This was my. Uh, my freshman year of college, they started it off with a 63-7 to win against Florida Atlantic. Uh, this was pre-Lane Kiffin. Um, they, FAU got the ball to start. They went seven plays, punted. Uh, K-State, a classic way to start the season. 15 plays, seven and a half minutes, 89 yards, 
touchdown. Uh, the first play of the year was Jesse Ertz' seven-yard run to the K-State 18. Uh, so they had a, a ways to go there. Nothing very exciting about the way the, that season started off. Uh, let's go back and uh, let's see the first play against, if it'll have it here. Yeah, the first play against UMass in 2009, Bill Snyder's first game back. Uh, it's a 10-play drive that ended with uh, a Carson Kaufman fumble at the UMass 25, but the first play of the season was a Daniel Thomas four-yard run. Uh, so that's a little bit of fun for uh, – for you guys there and uh, any other season recently that you want to go down memory lane real quick and find the first play of a home game. I, I excluded in 2016, the game oh. at Stanford. Uh, hmm. No. Okay. I didn't know if you wanted to try and guess or figure out what happened. <laughs> the problem is, is a lot of these, they're like pre climbing. Some of them were kind of stinkers in some ways. Like you think about 2018, everybody was having to sit there scared actually, half to death about losing to South Dakota. Actually, I'll be, we'll go full sicko. Give me 2011 Eastern Kentucky. Oh God, that was so bad. I was there. I have a <laughs> lot of really nasty, uh, what that, I would have been 13 at the time. A lot of nasty 13 year old Facebook posts about Colin <laughs> Klein saying how he's just not, he's not the guy like all this other stuff. Uh, well, I think I think you probably know how uh, that one ended. The first drive ended in a fumble for K State uh, that Eastern Kentucky ended up getting. So there you have it. But the, the one I, I just thought of one um, that I, that will that you'll be able to appreciate Mason both is when Tony Romo played mm. at K State. K State led fourteen nothing before they ran an offensive snap. Because they they had a defensive touchdown and a, a blocked punt touchdown before K State's offense even got the ball, so that's that fun. Was, that was a fun game. And, and Tony Romo, Romo threw for like two hundred yards in the first half. He he did throw it all over the field. I remember that game. But uh, I I just was just thinking. I remember there was a game where we we <laughs> scored fourteen points before we even ran an offensive play. That's uh yeah that is a, that's a good way to start things. Uh, I, I would love something like that to happen on Saturday. All right. Uh, moving forward and on with the questions I have for you, how many turnovers are forced by the K state defense on Saturday? This is in, intriguing for a couple of reasons. We know that it's one of the things that Chris Kleiman harped on a lot last year, especially after some of their losses was they didn't create enough turnovers. Uh, also we know that Everybody, probably me more than anybody else, wants to see if Marquis Siegel has hands attached to his arms this season. <laughs> so, and I say that with love. I hope everybody knows that. Uh, so, how many turnovers does the K State defense force in the game uh, on Saturday? I'm going to go with three. I'll say uh, two interceptions and one fumble recovery. Uh, I'll say two interceptions. Okay. Uh, I am going to go and say. Mm, I like the fumble thrown out there by fan. Um, I, I mean, this defense is supposed to be good. I think they go out there and uh, make a statement, and I think they have four. Uh, bouncing back after having zero like last year against SEMO, <laughs> which probably should have been the first indication that like, it was a 45 nothing <laughs> win, but you would have probably liked to have forced at least one turnover against an FCS school to think, hey, we might have something kind of going here. Um, so yeah, that's although you know their leading receiver last year at SEMO, uh, he he plays for the Cowboys now and might make their roster. So uh, they they had good weapons. Um, they made, my, they, they made some plays. They made yeah. some catches in that game. Yeah, and I mean maybe even like the, there were some plays even early in the game where I thought that they made some crazy catches, and you started to think, oh my gosh, is this Arkansas State all over mm -hmm. again? Like. Uh, and Troy maybe had a little bit of that too, where just some of the catches yeah. that K State's seen yeah. from these lower Louis, opponents yeah. recently, you just you're sh you're stunned by. Uh, the last question pertains to Avery Johnson in particular. How many yards and how many touchdowns? All passing. I don't care about what he does with his legs. Uh, I'll okay. say two. You don't have to be specific on the yardage. You can give me like a 
like an every oh. 10 situation. Oh. You know, you can give me 210 and I'll give you credit if he's at 209 or 211. I was very wound up to be very specific. Oh, you go I'll, for it then. <laughs> I'll say 227 in passing and three touchdowns because he has to pad the stats in this game to get over 24. Mm, we saw that went last year. <laughs> Not very well if we were chasing 24. I'll, I'll go with 240 and three touchdown passes. Okay. Uh, well, that's just... I keep telling D.Y. that he's a hater. So are you guys. Um, I am going to go with 275. And okay, okay, hold on. That's not two. that much more. That's 35 <laughs> more. That's 35 more. Well, well, my logic is is I do think we'll have some runs and some yes. rushing yardage. And I also think my hope is he only plays – Two and a half quarters as well. Yeah. So, well, I, I did. My, my pick was based on I don't think he's going to play the whole game either. I I did consider just going really low ball uh, on it with you, Drew, and after saying all that, go like one fifty and <laughs> saying like, yeah, they're going to run for like four hundred yards on Saturday. Um, I go low touchdown just because I, I mean they would have to. I think they're going to have to score the touchdowns through the air in deep balls because if not i think the hope would be on saturday anything inside the 10 yard line that's a carry almost always ends in a touchdown anything they get closer they're just going to run it because they're going to have the advantage with the offensive line and they're going to have three very gifted runners on the field not to mention what else they might try and do uh to to be a little sneaky so i i think actually it makes more sense for it to be lower in a game like this than it does in others, even though I do say it's important to go out and, and pad your stats in this game if you're trying to chase the, the record of 24. Uh, all right, three predictions on Saturday. I said that these can be as closely or loosely related to the game as you want them to be. They can be serious. They can be funny. They can be whatever you want them to be. Uh, we'll each take a turn here, uh, and I will let Drew go first. Uh, I'll say that K State goes over 40 points in that 42 range. I just think that uh, UT Martin has a pretty solid defense, but I, I think that K State will be able to be able to overwhelm them uh, with speed and think that the the offense will just have a big day. I will say K State collectively will have over 125 yards in return yards from punts and kickoff returns 125 plus i like that i like that a lot uh one of mine that i've been all over i think marquis siegel gets his first pick six of the season on saturday so I there you have it. i have a defensive and a special teams touchdown for k-state already two things that we know that when you put them together, always happen. It's always going to happen. Uh, pick number two, Drew. Uh, Kasich has four sacks on Saturday. I think that they're going to be able to rotate enough guys in uh, and be able to stay fresh on the defensive line. And, and I'm, a, I'm a big believer of this defensive line. I think that they could get four sacks. A touchdown will be scored by a quarterback named Roberson for the first time in 20 plus years. I like Bill that. Snyder one. Family Stadium. <laughs> I like I like that one. That's a that's a that is a that's a good one to throw out there for everybody. Uh I was thinking of going with a a backup quarterback one next, but I'm not going to do that. Um, but I will go ahead and say that for the first time since 2014, a locket scores a touchdown. Ooh. In Bill Snyder Ooh. Family Stadium. Uh, my third one was actually going to be a backup quarterback one, too. I was going to say that we see three different quarterbacks on Saturday. Uh, I was going to, I mean, would you would you go to four if I said four? No. Uh, no. You don't think there's a chance that they, <laughs> that they want to give Blake Barnett half a series? No. Uh, three, three and call it good. Okay. Then I'll say, I mentioned, I think uh, probably UT Martin's passing game is their strength, but I will say the K-State defense holds them under 200 yards through the air uh, in this game. 
Yeah, that's a that's a good one, and that's that's an important one too to see. Uh, I think for my third one, I am, and I said it could be as closely or loosely related. I am going to guess that uh, my daughter makes it through the entire game without having to be taken out early by my <laughs> wife. So, uh, <laughs> shout out to to Elliot Voth for making it through uh, and going all four quarters. So, uh, or I could also say that she doesn't cry when she gets her picture taken with Willie because that would be upset of the year after the encounter with Slugger at the Royals game. So we'll see <laughs> we'll see how it ends up going down with that one. She did make it through the entire Royals game when we went though. So that's why I think that's she good. can make it through the whole uh the whole game with with UT Martin. And night game, temperature's supposed to be good. I haven't uh looked recently to try and get everybody's hopes up again, but last I saw it was like 85 was the the yes. forecast for Saturday. Yeah. Yep. I mean, you can't That's ask for much nice. better this time of year uh for a, a kickoff. I think right. that, that I yeah. think that third pick by you might be the the funnest one. Uh, well, I'll, I'll have an update for everybody yes. on that one come uh come Sunday night next week and we'll see how it ends up going or maybe uh you get an update mid game after I get a text and it's like halftime and my wife's like yeah we're already driving back to your grandparents she is pissed off so we'll see <laughs> we'll see how it ends up going down there uh, also uh, one of my goals for is trying to get her picture taken with every opposing team's mascot that comes this Ooh. year uh that might and i kind of want to do that over the course of like her life i think that would be a fun thing to have um until she's probably like 14 years old and it's like Dad, I really do not want a picture <laughs> with the Florida A and M mascot. Can we not? So uh, we'll I mean, see. I just looked up. I just looked up the UT Martin mascot. I oh, yeah, Captain Skyhawk. Yeah, I will get a picture of him if he comes. Did you know that Captain Skyhawk is uh, gender neutral? He's not male or female, and so I learned that. Uh, which you would have thought, they, like, well, yeah, they probably made this mascot whatever you know last year or something trying to be pc for the for the public uh apparently it was it was more, longer than that so uh, i think they just they said they wanted to choose a term that was not you know assigned to one or the other so everybody felt like you know you could be captain skyhawk um i'm i don't feel like captain skyhawk but i look forward to seeing how that ends up playing out so there you go uh all right time to move on a little college football outsider talk uh, our our favorite way to end things here. A rem I want to let everybody know this isn't just a reminder. This is the first time I'm announcing it. On Thursday night at 8 o'clock, we will go live on the KSO YouTube page. It's going to be me, Drew, and DY basically just hanging out, shooting the bowl or whatever you want to call it uh, when games are going on. We'll answer questions that anybody wants to throw away, and we've got uh, various people lined up to kind of hop on and – talk K-State, talk other stuff going on in college football, just kind of a fun way to kick off the season and more so a way that I can have an excuse to to watch football on that Thursday because it's for work as opposed to, you know, whatever <laughs> else my wife wants me to do. Uh, but before we get out of here, our college football outsider, we'll take a look at the Big 12 games that are going on this week. There are a ton of them because there are a ton of teams <laughs> in the Big 12 now, and it will start on Thursday and Friday First game will be UCF in New Hampshire. I appreciate UCF back-to-back -back year starting on that Thursday, early Eastern time. And then joining them in action will be KU in Lindenwood, North Dakota State in Colorado, Southern Utah at Utah, and then TCU at Stanford is on Friday. Uh, Southern Utah, second straight year, they are starting with a <coughs> 12 team turn Big 12 team because last year they started at Arizona State, and that game got uh, delayed for a long time because of a haboob is what they call it, giant crazy sandstorm that took over uh, Sun Devil Stadium uh, before they got the second half started. Um, real quickly, rip through these and uh, tell me any thoughts that stand out to you about the first set of Big 12 games that we're going to get in the midweek. All right, UCF, New Hampshire, nobody cares. Lindenwood played Washburn four seasons ago and is now in the FCS, weird. Uh, North Dakota State, Colorado, probably the best game on this list. Southern Utah, Utah. No, oh, Lord. Uh, TCU Stanford. If TCU loses that, I think that shows more about how bad Sonny Dykes is than how good Stanford could be. 
But uh, I don't, I mean, Drew did a great job there. He came on strong with how nobody cared about New Hampshire and UCF. And then uh, just like any classic, you know, Topekin was like, do you know, Lindenwood played Washburn. So I, I, I loved it. That was perfect. That was exactly what I was looking for. Glad, mine, would that be, I mine would be, which is the better game, North Dakota State, Colorado, or TCU Stanford? Between those two, which is going to be the better ball game? North Dakota State, Colorado. Uh, yeah. Because I think it'll be more visually pleasing, the style that will be played. Uh, and then also, I still think there's a world, even as much as I've talked about Sonny and how he might be creeping up the fraud watch, uh, TCU should still be worlds better than Stanford and should probably win that game uh, by a couple scores. But as we know, even their good teams struggle on the road at Pac-12 teams like the 2022 TCU team. Uh, so this one's up to, to Sonny to make sure that he's playing the right quarterback from the start of the game and doesn't have to do it when somebody gets hurt. Uh, moving on, the first half of games on Saturday, it starts big noon, 11 o'clock our time, Penn State at West Virginia. Uh, I know that the people that are getting far too cute have West Virginia as a popular upset pick. I would not do that. And then South Dakota State, Oklahoma State, another really fascinating high-end FCS team coming and facing a Big 12 opponent, Towson and Cincinnati, who got their doors blown off by West Virginia last year, North Dakota at Iowa State, Tarleton State at Baylor, who Drew scouted over the weekend, and then UNLV in Houston. Uh, what are your takeaways from these games that are going to take place on Saturday? Because I'm probably more interested in what happens between O State and South Dakota State than I am Penn State and West Virginia. Yeah, I was going to say uh, Penn State rolls West Virginia. South Dakota State hangs around with Oklahoma State, but Oklahoma State still wins. No part of me wants to even acknowledge that Towson and Cincinnati are playing. Uh, Iowa State struggles sometimes with FCS teams, so I think it'd be kind of funny if they struggled with North Dakota. Uh, Baylor will probably uh, destroy Tarleton State. And and I'll, I'll call it upset. I'll say UNLV beats Houston. Is Is that an upset? I think that Houston's still favored. Okay. Yeah, you're probably right. Betting wise, probably, probably the case. I was going to ask about that game if you thought UNLV spoiled uh, Willie Fritz's first game with the Cougars. But it is a very weird scenario because UNLV's quarterback decided to transfer to Georgia to be the backup instead of staying at UNLV. It's tough. So, <laughs> so that part is interesting. Yeah, I. I... I'm curious to see West Virginia just because you know, I think a lot of people, myself included, have them as a team to watch and maybe one of K-State's toughest games this year is going to West Virginia. So how Penn State fares there to open the season um, could be telling of what West Virginia really is. Uh, South Dakota State picked you know, by many to win FCS title again at Oklahoma State will be fun, especially after we saw Oklahoma State lose to – what South Alabama last year at home. So that one is intriguing. And and that UNLV Houston game, uh, Willie Fritz is a favorite of a lot. I think he is a good coach, but I think he has a lot of work to do at Houston and wasn't left a lot by Dana. So um, that will be a, an interesting game to watch. Yeah. My, Mike Gundy and Oklahoma state, they have had some really scary games against lower end opponents uh, over the years. I mean, central Michigan got them. Uh, the Missouri State kind of take them to the brink at one point. Um, so they they definitely struggle early in the season to look appealing. So I'll be fascinated to see how that one ends up playing out. And then uh, the final wave of games on Saturday, the games that really everybody cares about are right here. Uh, and I say that mainly because K-State is on the screen. Uh, all these other games, I could kind of care less. I do think Arizona State-Wyoming will be interesting because that will be a good barometer of, just how bad Arizona State is because Wyoming should not be good this year. Uh, coaching turnover, everything else. I mean, Arizona State should win that game. That'll be interesting to, to see because if Arizona State struggles in that one, they have to go to Texas State either next week or week three. So they're they're going to be in a weird spot. Uh, these games, anything stand out here other than Texas Tech has once again scheduled an opponent that they'll try and drop 77 on from the FCS ranks. I was I was gonna say I feel like Texas Tech plays Abilene Christian every year like that <laughs> like that, that feels like a game that happens a lot 
Uh, Southern Illinois having to go to BYU was kind of a rough, a rough trip as an FCS team. Uh, New Mexico, uh, good luck. You couldn't stop the run against uh, Montana State. I wonder what Arizona is going to try and do to you. And then uh, I'll say Wyoming beats Arizona State. Why not? Okay. All right. Well, there, there you go. Uh, as someone that has Arizona State in our uh, in our league that we picked, oh, that's uh, true. I, I don't have faith in them to win more than two games. Um, real quick, Drew, just a fact check on you. The last time that Texas Tech and Abilene Christian played in football was 1949. <laughs> it feels like they, it feels like they play one of one of the purple Texas schools every. They year. did play Tarleton last year Ooh. or the year prior. I'm pretty sure. Uh, but according to the Texas Tech Athletics website, which is not always correct, uh, they've only played nine times, and the last time was 1949. So, oh, but if weird. you were if you were alive in the 20s, they played every year from 1925 through 1931. There you go. That's what I was thinking of. Yeah. So I don't know. I mean, somebody might go look that up from a more reliable source than uh, the you know the sidearm history pages, which have been known to be incorrect in the past. But uh, that's the best I can go off of right now because I don't really care too much about Abilene Christian and Texas Tech. Um, and then, Hey, New Mexico, do they, do they avenge their drop ball loss, uh, this past weekend and surprise everybody against Arizona? No, I, I don't think so. I don't think so. I, 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 I do think Southern Illinois BYU is a bit intriguing because Southern Illinois is kind of top, just on the top 10 fringe in the FCS. And I don't know how good BYU is. So, um, I, I think there could be some intrigue in that game. And I, I do think Wyoming, Arizona state could be a competitive, pretty competitive game as well. Yeah, some big 12 schools played some tougher FCS teams. And it's the ones that I'm not really sure about like Colorado and BYU that I'm like, yep. you might've got a little more than you were asking for. Yeah. Uh, anything else college football wise, before we get out of here, that it, you, you guys are interested to watch or see, this weekend and week one. So any non big 12 related uh, happenings that you uh, are going to be interested in checking out. Uh, I think that Georgia might maul Clemson. I'm just not a big believer in Clemson this year and think that Georgia has a lot of depth and a lot of talent and that game being in Atlanta. I, I just don't see that going well for Clemson. Yeah. It is, is Dabo's approach of not using the portal at all really ever – is it going to work? And uh, I guess this will be a pretty pretty good way to tell. Yeah, I I, I think the I think that the, the, some of those games are kind of fascinating. I, Clemson is another one of those teams that, you know, kind of like Florida State in the ACC. They have the name and the brand power attached to them, and they have all this hope that, hey, maybe they're going to get it. I think the Clemson ship has sailed. I – I just am not a big believer in the way that that sets up right now. So I think uh, that'll be a nice way to start the season, knowing early on that Georgia is just going to say, yeah, Clemson, you're not good enough for this. Sorry, we don't have to worry about you. Uh, I, I mean, the other thing that I'll probably be interested in is, is seeing how Will Howard looks at Ohio State. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know it's just Akron that they're playing, um, but like this is one of those early on where you would think you have all this talent around you. It's going to be so much better than – Akron, even compared to what you're going to face other times, you got to put it on display and, and go out there early. And very similar to what K-State might want to try and do with Avery Johnson is, is show that you can get this done here. You can you can be the man like this, how we need it. That's that's probably one of the games that I'll be interested in. Just I probably won't watch a ton of it, but I'll definitely be checking the box score here and there, uh, trying to see, okay, here's how it's tracking, here's how it looks, and going from there. But that's probably the the number one thing that I'll be most interested in that doesn't pertain to the big 12. The, the only other one I throw yeah. out is, is how does Colin Klein fare against the top 10 Notre Dame team? That could yeah. be interesting just because of the Colin Klein connection. The the other one that I just thought of as a newly found Colorado state hater, I hope that Texas beats <laughs> them by like 70. <laughs> yes. Hey, but, but were, but were they tricked by that? online Twitter guy that's with the fake account. Maybe maybe we shouldn't hate Colorado State so much. 
Maybe they were just duped. They were victims, honestly. Uh, just a quick reminder for everybody. Uh, a couple of – it was three months ago that we drafted our teams for the Big oh, yeah. 12 this year. Uh, a reminder of who has who. Fan has Utah, UCF, TCU, and Cincinnati. DY has Oklahoma State, KU, Colorado, and Houston. Drew has – the best team probably uh very top heavy k-state iowa state baylor and arizona state and then i have arizona texas tech west virginia and byu i remember coming out of that and thinking that i liked drew's the best the further away we are from it i'm starting to buy in on my team a little bit more and i also hate dy's a lot and i think i hated it in the moment but just looking back on it i hate it even more now because uh, Two of those teams are going to be stinky no matter what, and there's a chance that his top two teams he picked, they end up being like seven and five stinky. Yeah, I mean, KU and Colorado, that's, that's a tough scene for DY, the, the noted Jayhawk hater. Oh, I thought – I thought you were uh, you were saying that those were the two stinky teams that I alluded to and that <laughs> Houston and O State well, were the ones that could be stinky. <laughs> well, I'm not saying that I did. I wasn't thinking that. <laughs> Yeah, I'll uh, I'll have I'll have to start tracking those, and I uh, need to track down my piece of paper where I wrote down the scoring system that we came up with. Uh, so I have that definitely somewhere here in my basement. <laughs> so we'll get that figured out. But that will do it for us today. The next time you hear from us, the Cats will have one game in the books. It will be next Sunday. We will recap K State and UT Martin. Start to set the scene for what comes next with K-State and Tulane. But before we get to week two, you got a full week one ahead of you. Tomorrow, Chris Kleiman has his first in-season press conference. We will have coverage from that. And then we will have stuff for you all throughout the week, building up to kickoff at 6 o'clock on Saturday night. So be sure to stay tuned with K-State Online right here on the YouTube so you can subscribe, share, comment, whatever you want to do to support KSO. And if you are a member of K-State Online, Go to on three, do what you've been doing, unless it's starting another Will Howard thread that drives DY nuts uh, just to wake up every day and see another Will Howard thread. So maybe do that. Uh, I, I would challenge anybody that watches or listens to this, find a creative way to start a Will Howard thread every single day of the week. Um, however you want to do it. If you want to do like a Will Howard top five moments at K-State and it's just every turnover in that Oklahoma State game in 2020, however you want to do it, I encourage you to do that. Uh, and if you're not a member of KSO, this is a very creative way to kick off your your message board experience uh, by going in and trolling DY. So uh, nobody tell him that I sent you to do that. I'm just going to see if he figures out what happened on his own. Uh, but that's what you can do to, to have fun and support KSO as we start the 2024 football season this week. So for Fan, Drew, I am Mason. Back again tomorrow to recap everything Chris Kleiman said. Also, this will be the best place for you to find Chris Kleiman's press conferences, whether it's in season or after games right here. We'll get them up immediately for you. Uh, that way, when you're stuck in traffic for four and a half hours trying to get to I-70, you will be able to hear what Chris Kleiman had to say about his team's performance. So we are out of here. Talk to you again tomorrow.